Hi everyone. Thanks for joining our inaugural communications webinar for community partners. Asian Americans Advancing Justice AAJC is excited to launch a new webinar series focused on strategic communications best practices and ways to use press, social media, and communication tools to advance your work. Next slide, please. We're excited to kick off this new training series with our inaugural webinar on Media Training 101, What You Need to Know. The webinar will explore what you need to know about working with press, finding the right news outlet for you, how to plan your media approach, what you need to pitch your story, and what the press wants to hear from you. We are joined by two communications experts who will be leading us through today's today's session. First is Bernadine or Bernie Hahn, uh, who is Group Vice President, News Standards and Practices for Spectrum Networks, a series of 24-7 news and sports networks owned and operated by Charter Communications. In this role, Bernie is responsible for ensuring that Spectrum Networks maintains the highest and most rigorous standards of fairness and integrity, and is a model for ethical, fact-based news reporting and storytelling. We are also joined by Michelle Boykins, who is the Senior Director of Strategic Communications at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Michelle has more than 20 years as an experienced communications and marketing professional. She has secured major news coverage from CNN, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. She's been interviewed by numerous media outlets from MSNBC, and Fox television networks to NPR and CBS radio and quoted in various consumer magazines from Consumer Reports to Women's Day. As Senior Director of Strategic Communications, Michelle develops and implements the organization's strategic communications vision and leads media relations and marketing efforts. Next slide, please. Today's webinar and this new three-part communications training series is made possible with the support of our sponsor, Charter Communications, a leading broadband connectivity company and cable operator serving more than 30 million customers in 41 states through its Spectrum brand. Advancing Justice AAJC is proud to serve on Charter's External Diversity and Inclusion Council and work in partnership with Charter to empower and advance local communities, including the Asian and Asian American community. Next slide. We have four goals today. Understand benefits of working with the media, learning what is newsworthy, understanding the news cycle, and learning how to and who you should approach. If you have questions during the presentation, please raise your hand to be unmuted or ask your questions in the chat box or the questions box. And we will have reserved time at the end for Q&A too. And you can use the chat box or questions box to send your questions or raise your hand to have your line unmuted at that time. The webinar is recorded and we will send out the recording and presentation after the webinar. So without further ado, I will turn it over to my colleagues, Michelle and Bernie. Thank you so much, Bessie. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Boykins, as Bessie said, from Advancing Justice AHAC, and I'm about to share with you a clip that will help you understand why it's good to prepare for your close-up, and this is a really good start to the presentation to help you understand more. with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, our position is. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. Obviously what the, our position is. Next slide, please, Mary. So that clip is from Paul Manafort, and it's from 2016, and it says a lot in a few seconds, and not much of it is good. This is a situation where clearly he should have been prepared to answer that question from the reporter, and if he had 
done that preparation, he would have come off uh, much better on camera and would have had a better answer. So our job today, myself and Bernie, is to help you begin to have that foundation for how you work with the media, how you engage with them. And then as we go through our webinar series, you will actually learn how to interview properly with media. So let's talk about why we need to engage with the media. We are talking to you today because if you find the right journalist and the right media outlet, they can help you reach your target audience or an audience that you seek while sharing the information that you're doing about your work. So it's really about using them as an ally. Next slide, please. The media can be so important in the work that you do and can help you elevate the work that you're doing. So think about it for a moment. The right media story that's aired a few times on the news can help you reach more people than perhaps the multiple community events that you might have to share that same information. Next slide. So the media helps you develop more visibility for the work you do, the organization you represent, and it can br help bring people to your cause who might want to donate, who might want to volunteer, or who might want to follow you on social media. Next slide. The media is especially helpful in those situations where you need to get the community to take a stand or to understand the relevance of a local or national issue. It's also helpful to educate people who might not be familiar with your organization or might not be familiar with the importance of your issue. But to engage the media correctly, you must understand what they find newsworthy. Next slide. So I'll, I'll pick this up from you, Michelle. This is Bernie Hahn. How is everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we're talking about everybody. Uh, Michelle, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, we're talking about what is newsworthy, and, and there are some basic characteristics um, that that help to define when a story is newsworthy. And we're gonna. I'm gonna go through. Um, the bullets that you see here with a little bit more uh, detail and give you some examples of that. So if we can uh, go to the next slide. Um, you know, of course, uh, one thing that makes something newsworthy is that, you know, um, that it is new. In, you know, in the word news is the word new. So um, news media is going to be much more interested in, in uh, reporting out um, and, and um, producing stories and advancing stories that are that are happening right now. Um, less interested in something that happened yesterday or last week or last month, unless there's an update to that story, which then makes it new again. Um, another characteristic of what makes a story newsworthy is whether the the, the event, the subject, the program. Uh, uh, there's something new, uh, different about it, unique about it, um, that it will pique uh, the viewer or the reader's attention, something that's different. So the example I gave here is, you know, a dog biting a man is not going to be newsworthy because that's, that's, you know, a regular occurrence, but uh, as opposed to a man biting a dog, and at that point, then that's an oddity. That's something strange, and that's something that uh, a news organization could would potentially uh, report on. Um, relevant. The new the the story um, needs to be relevant and needs to resonate with the viewers and the readers. Something you know it, the the information needs to be there to help people make decisions um, on their you know. For in their daily lives, whether it's a weather report in the morning, whether it is, um, you know, like I give the example, election dates, how to, you know, we're talking about voting, you know, so uh, um, reg voting registration deadlines, things like that, all of that information is relevant and is considered newsworthy. 
Um, next slide. So the significance, this is what I would, you know, call, uh, or this is where I would ask the question, so what, right? So is this, you know, there's a story pitch, uh, and I'd say, you know, so what? Um, and the, the better answer is the answer where the, the story has a much greater impact, right? Um, the greater the impact, the bigger the story, the more chance that that story is going to be um, published uh, or make it onto television. So the example I give here is two car, co you know, two car accident on a, on a small side street, you know, as compared to a multi-vehicle accident um well, on a, a major interstate shutting down the, the roadway in both ways that the second story uh is much more impactful um another characteristic of of a newsworthy story is prominence so people like to hear and read about famous people um what they're doing what they have been doing um what they plan to do what they've just said you know, so the example I came up with, everybody's going to be so much more interested in, in LeBron James breaking his arm than in Bernie Hahn breaking her arm, right? Um, next characteristic uh, um, of a newsworthy story is proximity. And this is where when a story is happening that is, you know, impacting a community. Um, and I give the example of, a hurricane bearing down on the, on the Dominican Republic. So, you know, the people who are, who live on the, you know, live on the island there, obviously this is a big story for them. This, you know, this story would be a big story for them. But also um, I want to stress that proximity doesn't always mean geographic location. Uh, a hurricane bearing down on the Dominican Republic is important and people in, on the, in the Dominican Republic would want to know about it, but also uh, people who are from that country. So, for example, New York City has a very large Dominican population. This story would also be a big story uh, in New York City because of the people it's impacting, the community that, community that is, it is impacting. Next slide. Conflict and controversy, this is, you know, probably not something new to, to everybody. We all know that, um, and we see it every day in the news, um, debates, disagreements, you know, um, point, counterpoint, those types of arguments all are potentially newsworthy depending on the issues that are, are being raised in those discussions. Um, and yeah, people like to take sides. People like to pick sides. People like to root for their own team. Um, and people nowadays also, especially, like to make public their points of view. So that, um, that is also newsworthy. And then also anything in the extreme. Um, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records, the first person to do this, the first, uh, the first company to, to do that. You're, you're the fastest, you're the best, you're the biggest, you're the, the, the strongest, you're the loudest, you have the most cases, you have the most, you know, all of that um, will generate interest and, and be considered newsworthy. Um, when I say avoid crying wolf, that means that um, we, you know, if we're going out and doing the story and pitching that we are going to be the first, we are the best, that it needs to be the case. Um, and the reporter is going to uh, do his or her homework to make sure that what we are pitching is the best. Seems like we might have lost Bernie. All right, Mary, do you want to go on to the next slide?
Okay, um, I'll try to pick up from uh, from Bernie and hopefully we can uh, get her back on. There were some storms in her area, so uh, she might be experiencing a little challenge there. Um, so in, in terms of competition, um, thinking about what is happening in the news at that moment. So you may have a story that's really newsworthy and that at any other time would grab people's attention. But right now during Black Lives Matter protests, you're not going to get that same opportunity for coverage because the story of the moment is about those Black Lives Matter protests and what's happening in each and every city and what that movement stands for and uh and having people Hi. talk about it hi bernie <laughs> great i'm sorry was, the phone just totally dropped you. out <laughs> i'm sure you did an amazing job too Michelle. <laughs> i was just talking about competition so uh so you can pick up on on human interest uh i was just saying that with competition uh if you have something like a, a Black Lives Matter uh, protest situation happening, you have to understand that even though your story might be newsworthy, it's not going to be the story that they're going to want to run with because those Black Lives Matter protests is the news moment. Exactly. It, you know, and, and to a certain extent, competition will, what else is going on in the news day that day will affect the placement of your story in that show or in the paper, right? So depending on um, if it's a, you know, quote unquote, a, a light news day, the, there's more of a chance of your story getting picked up and, and get and running higher up in the show or, you know, um, in the first, you know, in, in the front page of the paper, as opposed to a day where we have, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests or other massive major things going on. So that was great, Michelle. Exactly right. <laughs> um, and then human interest. Human interest, these stories, uh, human interest stories tend not to follow the usual rules of no newsworthiness. So all those other bullets that I just went through apply, except for when you're talking about um, stories that kind of, um, have an emotional element to them um, and, and appeal to to emotion. So, because people are always interested in what other other people are saying or doing, and you know, especially video. Um, so, these types of stories tend to be the stories that are much more personal, much more of a profile. Um, and depending on the news organization that you're pitching to, this story, these types of human interest stories could either be, you know, the lead of the show or the front page of a publication, or it could actually be what we call a kicker, which would be at the end of a show or sort of the final word of, of a publication. Um, next slide. Great, thank you, Bernie. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're now into the situation where you have decided that you have a newsworthy topic or issue that you want to bring. And now's your moment to prepare and to really think about how you're going to um, how you're going to approach a reporter. And so I try to think of it these questions in these terms. If a reporter approached you today about one of your issues, are you ready to answer these questions on this slide? Is your agenda to help people understand the scope or severity of a problem? Or do you, do you have a goal of what you want to achieve in mind? Are you trying to motivate people to take action or is it something else that you're trying to do with getting that story told? And who do you want to reach is a question you have to ask yourself. I think often in the process of trying to engage the media, because there are so many different ways to, to cut that question of who is your audience uh, and, and who do you want to reach? So I know Bernie's going to speak more to that in a few minutes. And, uh, and so I'll leave that to her. But uh, 
If you can go to the next slide, please. You can spend a little bit more time uh, before talking more about audience on uh, who you want to reach is also going to help you tailor your key messages and your talking points for that audience. So what do you want to say to them? It helps you determine in that audience and in that set of key messages, it helps you determine whether or not you're thinking this should be a TV interview that I seek versus a newspaper or radio. It also helps you determine if you want to use a different medium like a podcast, for example. So you have to consider how you fit into the news moment and we'll spend another minute on how you fit in on the next slide. There are two types of media approaches. We're either proactive or we're reactive. You're more likely familiar with using uh, press releases or seeing people share press releases out uh, across your networks. And that's really a proactive approach. Uh, it's an opportunity to say to a journalist, hey, I've got something that you might be interested in. And uh, it has a nice kind of package to help that reporter determine if they really are interested and want to bring that to their listenership, viewership, readership. And you can also do some other proactive things in this process as well. You can call up a reporter directly. That is what we call pitching a reporter in the communications realm. So you may call them up and say, I have this newsworthy story for you and lay it out for them and help them understand why it's important that they cover it for you. And reactive, you're in a situation where you're, you're responding to the breaking news or uh, reactive can also be receiving a request from a reporter. So a reporter might call you up and they have a deadline or they wanna speak to an expert about this particular topic or current event situation that's going on. And so you have to jump into reactive mode. Many of you on this call have seen statements, letters to the editor, those are, those are completely reactive moments. Uh, but I also wanna talk about op-eds because op-eds can be used in either form. And uh, I'll give you an example of that just from my own work. I submitted a, a proactive op-ed and sent that to uh, an editor that I knew. And um, I thought it was a, had a really good chance of getting into the outlet. They rejected it. But a few weeks later, when there was an immigration legislation, leg, legislative battle, wow, I can't say that word twice, when there's an immigration legislative battle going on in Congress, one of the editors reached back out to me and asked if Advancing Justice AJC could do an analysis of the situation and the legislation that was being considered. And so that was an opportunity for our subject matter expert to jump in do that analysis for us to be able to go back to them with something that we knew that they were going to run. So even though we didn't get that initial op-ed, and we had planted in their minds that we were someone that they could come back to on that issue if they needed to. Next slide, please. So when we talked about newsworthiness, there's also uh, the hook where Bernie talked about the uh, example of LeBron James breaking his arm versus Bernie breaking her arm. We would care, of course, if Bernie broke her arm. But it's, uh, right now, the Lakers are in this uh, coronavirus uh, playoff, right? So, uh, so LeBron James breaking his arm is a big deal. Um, you have to think about what creates the interest in a story for a reporter or for the person who's going to ultimately see that story on air. So 
um, I use this example because this is one where it's interesting to me that this is a story that's been told more than once, a bride with cold feet, right? A runaway bride. But if it's wedding season, that story suddenly has interest again. Uh, so you can also look at things like that, um, seasonal things, uh, anniversary things to see if there's a way to be able to bring them back with a different hook or a new twist on the hook that you've tried before and uh, and engage them in a different way. And when thinking about creating something that's newsworthy, you can also look at bringing local flavor to a national story. And what I mean by that is thinking about uh, let's say the coronavirus. So when everyone was talking about the coronavirus and uh, how it was spreading early on, I noticed that the media wasn't really talking about the racist attacks that were happening against Asian Americans. So that became my hook on how to approach the media. So I was taking something they were already talking about, but I was bringing a different hook to the table in engaging with them. So it's important to think about the fact that there might be a story that the media is already using and already talking about, but you may have a unique angle to it. You may have a potential local impact to new legislation or something else about the coronavirus and how it's affecting your community. So think about how you want to shape your story and what your hook is going in to working with the media. Next slide. Michelle, do you want to take a question now or wait? Um, I, yeah, I can take a question right now. Uh, what's the question? Yeah, this question is from Margaret Liu and they ask, can you explain more about op-eds? Is this similar to submitting a letter to the editor? Okay, um, sure, I can I can stop and, and talk about that for a second. And Bernie, please feel free to jump in as well. Uh, a letter to the editor and an op-ed are completely different things. So letter to the editor, you're writing about something that, uh, that you've seen uh, and you're writing a response because maybe the person who had written the previous piece didn't get the facts right or, um, you know, or there's additional context and information you can bring to the table. With an opinion editorial, you are, you're looking at really being a, a subject matter expert, giving people information that they, they didn't know before or helping them think about that information in a different way. So we try to, um, to use the op-eds is an opportunity to talk about uh, issues of, of immigration, issues of um, uh, actually one of the op-eds that uh, that we just did was around census and uh, and talking to people about the importance of the census, but taking the opportunity to call out some new benefits and information that people not might not be thinking about when they think about the census. Because by now, hopefully everyone's heard about the census and heard about how it can help bring resources to your community for roads and schools and you know so on and so forth. But um, also talking about how businesses use that information to bring a local uh, you know, Korean market to a particular area or to bring uh, kimchi to a, uh, a store that um, that has not sold ethnic related products before in their store. So looking at different ways to be able to to talk about that issue and bringing that uh, to bear in an opinion piece to help people understand um, s the significance of that. Um, so I'm going to stop there and ask Bernie if you want to jump in with any other points on that. Yeah. Um... So I think the the other two things that we should consider um, as differences is that the the letters letters to the editor um, are usually run through do run through the news department, whereas um, editorials 
uh, and um, opinion pieces will run through, generally speaking, the editorial board, which is a completely separate part of the the company, the the publication. Um, and neither the two groups shall meet. The news team and the <laughs> Editorial boards will never commingle. I'm, I'm sure you've read um, some of the issues that have um, bubbled up to the surface uh, at, say, like the Washington Post and the New York Times with regards to that. The the letters to the editor tend to be more um, tied back to, or the ones that actually get printed tend to tie back to a story or a series that had that ran in in the newspaper. Um, whereas the op-eds are not so much tied to sort of the news of the day. Um, both pieces are grounded in, uh, in fact, and in fact will go through rigorous fact-checking by the publication, but um, they're run by two completely different parts of that, uh, that publication. Thank you. Great. So, mm -hmm. There is a follow-up. Uh, do mm -hmm. you submit your op-ed to the editorial board? And can only experts submit an op-ed? I mean, anybody, yeah, I mean, I, I, anybody can submit uh, an op-ed. And yes, the op-eds go to the editorial board. Even if it gets sent to the editor, the editor will will forward it on. If it's an op-ed piece, will forward it on to the editorial board. Anybody can submit. It's just a matter of what the editorial board will decide to print. Yeah, and I think the other point there is that you do you you don't have to be a subject matter expert mm -hmm. with. Uh, you know, a big following to have an op-ed placed in in a newspaper. Uh, but if you can bring something compelling to the table uh, and you can support that opinion, then you have the opportunity to break through as much as, as anyone else. Exactly. Okay, uh, great question. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, we were talking about in uh, in terms of preparing for the interview and uh, and that last point about taking something perhaps that's national and bringing that local and thinking about um, Mary, can you go to the next slide? Sorry, one more. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, so thinking about that further, uh, thinking about the the COVID nineteen example uh, uh, as an as a uh, as an example here. So, do you have a a real life example of uh, someone who has been attacked, or maybe you actually have someone who fits two of these categories, where you might have a doctor who or a nurse who has been attacked um, and can also talk about what it's like to be on the front lines treating someone with COVID-19. And um, those are the kind of things that the reporters are going to ask you as well. Um, I can't tell you how many times in talking about the racist attacks against Asian Americans that uh, when I'm talking to a journalist or a producer that they say, do you have someone in my area that I can talk to? And that's something that helps you have a leg up. So thinking about having real life examples or being able to talk about uh, statistics on the impact of the virus in your state or in your community or even within your ethnic group, giving those hard facts are things that help to flesh out the story for the journalist. And 
uh, if you have other things like visuals, uh, you know, video B-roll for them or pictures that can help round out their story, you really have helped that journalist tell a full story um, in, you know, in their interaction with you. So that's, um, that's something often uh, that we get asked about, and uh, and if you can figure out that way of how you fit in to the story that you want them that you want to be told, it really helps them understand what what else they might ask from you and what else they might need from you. Next slide. So Bernie, I think this is where you take over. So thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think part of what we should we need to consider when we uh, pitch stories um, is you want to do a little homework on the news organization that you're pitching to because um, specifically their audience, their reach, the market that they serve, um, the demographics of their viewership, of their readership, because then that can help inform that t those insights can help inform what angle the way you um, should pitch the reporter and also what the reporter is going to uh, need, what information the reporter is going to need from you. Um, because the reporter is going to want to produce content that will, will resonate with, with his or her viewers or readers. So to help to help the reporter do that, um, if you arm yourself with that information at the onset, <clears throat> that just makes for a much more powerful pitch. Um, you know, the second bullet, what's in it for me? You know, that's the you know, so what um, question, right? So why why do we care? Why why should the viewers or the readers of that publication um, that television show care about this uh, program or the story that you're pitching. So just um, make sure that, you know, go back to the list of what's newsworthy. Uh, make sure that you can answer that question because the reporter is going to ask, so why should my viewers care? Um, and what type of interview will help me achieve my goal? I, I, I think the next page, right, um, Mary, if you go to the next page, we actually t talk about the different interviews, right? So depending on the story, depending on the publication, depending on the news uh, organization that you're pitching to, there are um, different types of interviews um, um, that they're going to ask for, the reporter's going to ask for. The first kind of interview is, is actually conducted by the reporter, the street reporter. Um, that could be, you know, over the phone if the reporter um, only really needs information from you um, that they will then cite and attribute in the story and, and your organization would be um, cited in the story as a source. Or they would actually maybe want to, uh, for in this, in, when you're talking about television, they would actually want to do an interview with you, in which case the reporter will, will meet you somewhere or come to your office and set up a camera and do the interview and cut sound bites out of there. Um, there are going to be times where reporters are going to call you or, and ask you for information, but not necessarily um, do an interview. In other words, not necessarily pull any quotes from you or any sound bites from you, but only pull the information from you and attribute that information to your organization. But those are all, um, that's an interaction with, uh, with the reporter. And if you go to the next page, um, we're talking about now anchor driven interviews. And these are interviews that are driven, that are led by um, a television anchor. Um, and what ends up happening here is actually you're going to be, you know, a show producer or, or the anchor has, will have a producer or a team of producers and writers talk, uh, working on that show. 
and you will be interviewed, we call it a pre-interview, by that producer or maybe that associate producer to get a sense of what you're going to say, to get a sense of the information that you're going to relay um, um, in the actual interview. And it will also help the producers come up with questions for the anchor to ask. And then the actual interview itself is usually conducted on the anchor set. So you would walk, you would go to the studio and be mic'd up and be sitting next to the anchor um, and the interview would take place there. Um, of course, there are some, you know, some exceptions, like for example, whenever the president gives a, a sit down interview, the president we, you know, the reporter will go to the White House instead of having the president come to the news station. Um, same thing maybe with some other high-ranking officials, government, you know, governors and such. But most of the time, the interviews are done on the anchor set. The actual interview itself, depending on the length of the show, will be seen in its entirety. So it could be anywhere from a five-minute to ten-minute to a half-hour, depending on the the type of show we're talking about, interview. Uh, it could be done live to air, or it could be pre-recorded and uh, aired later. Um, and then also you have to keep in mind, too, that once that interview is done, um, the producers also have the ability to, to cut sound bites, excerpt out some of what you said in the interview to be used in follow-up stories, to be used in promotional and marketing material, to be posted on, on social sites, on digital sites. Um, so there's opportunity for them to, you know, for the producers to multi-purpose use that, that interview. Um, next page. Michelle? Great. So um, I'm reading in the, uh, the chat box, uh, someone asked a follow-up question to you. Uh, the op-ed and uh, and thank you, Mary, for uh, for answering. But uh, thought it would be helpful just to share that with everyone in case they aren't looking at the chat box. Someone asked if it's okay to send multiple publications the same op-ed, and uh, and the answer is you really want to send to one publication at a time and give them a deadline to respond because for you it may be great to think about uh, that you have the same op-ed in multiple publications but uh, for that outlet who published they're not going to be very happy about that when bernie talked about wanting to be the best the first um, that also applies to newsrooms and outlets as well you'll hear on the local news uh, and you're hearing this first from CBS or from NBC and they take pride in that, uh, bring, being able to bring people new and original content uh, that they're not hearing on other stations and you want to be sure that you're part of helping them to do that and not actually turning them off and uh, making the road a little harder for you the next time that you want to approach one of those outlets. Thank you, Michelle. We had an earlier question too from Grace Lee who asks, can someone speak a bit about how to build relationships with media or editors? Oh, Bernie, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so I think um, part of that process includes doing a little bit homework homework about that organ about that uh, newsroom right and sort of the, the types of programming that they offer and then specifically um, doing some interview uh, some uh, research on the, the the types of reporters that they have and the type and the content that they produce so there are many news organizations that actually have beat reporters, especially in the uh, you know, world of newspaper. They have beat reporters um, who are assigned to cover a particular you know, piece of uh, content, a content vertical or a topic, whether it's health or politics or sports. And those beat reporters, their, their currency, their, what makes them valuable is their contacts. 
to subject matter experts in the field that they were assigned to cover. So an, a, an effective and efficient way to reach out to a news organization is actually through the reporter who's been assigned to cover the beat that your that covers your organization or or the program or your initiative. Um, and the many way you know nowadays you can it's you can reach out to these reporters through social media. Most every reporter will have a social media profile. We'll have a Twitter. Uh, we'll be on Twitter. We'll we'll be on Instagram. We'll be you know on even potentially Facebook, but definitely Twitter and reporters actually solicit and expect you know um dms from people um that's how a lot of times now they get um they get news tips is is through social media and they will respond back to you on social media and then from there um we'll put we'll potentially set up a phone conversation um and then from there could lead to you know coffee meetings over you know coffee which right now is a little bit difficult, but um, pre-COVID days, and once we get past COVID, um, you know, there'll be coffee meetings or you know, source meetings, and you you want to start developing the relationship that way, and also calling the reporters and giving them a heads up about something that may be happening, um, um, and then just making sure that you're on that person that reporter's radar, so that when a story um, breaks or when there's a story that they're following or that's been assigned that they know that you're there and can reach out to you for background information all the way up through uh, doing an interview with you so I hope I hope that answered your question um, and I'll add one one other thing to that Bernie is that when you make that phone call or that outreach to the reporter you also want to make sure that you have like one or two ideas to to share with them, to pitch them, so to speak, so that if they're you're having that conversation and they say, you know, um, well, what else do you have? You've got something in your back pocket mm -hmm. to to talk about as well. So when I am talking to a reporter and and trying to gauge what they're working on and and how we might be helpful i always have a couple of ideas in my pocket to be able to say well here's something that you might want to think about related to this topic and that helps them understand too that you're you're really trying to to help them be able to do their job as well and it really is about building a rapport with them Right, and also being aware, and as you start building this rapport, you also will get a sense of what their deadlines are and what their, you know, what their editors are demanding from them, right? So there are reporters, there are newsrooms where the editor will say, I need you to turn three piece, three stories this week. And, you know, if you can help in any way, you know, in, in, in in those deadlines and helping to find those stories for that that reporter i think you know then you become that go-to person one of the go-to people that the reporter will call and say hey you got anything for me hey what's what what are the some new things that you guys are working on great so we're going to jump into a an exercise that uh, we typically do when we're when we have this training in person, we uh, try to have people understand how to uh, to write a sound bite so that in the moment where they might be asked to be on camera, they already have something that they've been thinking about, they've been toying around with in their head. So in order to take you through this exercise, let's first talk about what a sound bite is. Next slide. When you're thinking about a sound bite, you want to think about that three to three to nine seconds uh, phrase or statement that, when you say it, is going to make someone perk up. Like their 
they're going to tune in differently because you said something that really sparked their interest when they heard it. And I'm going to take you through two different examples and then we're going to invite you to do this exercise to try to create a soundbite for one of your issues and you can feel free to either raise your hand to share it verbally with us or you can also write it in the chat box if you uh, if you don't want to share it uh, amongst everyone um, verbally. Mary, next slide, please. This is a uh, soundbite from Advancing Justice Agency's president and executive director when we were doing a, uh, a Muslim ban rally in Richmond a couple of years ago. We uh, we're on the bus going down to Richmond and uh, he's looking at his talking points and he says, I don't feel like we've completely nailed uh, a soundbite that I feel like I can use over and over again when uh, when talking to reporters. And, and so we spent a little time on that. And the piece that really hones in on the soundbite is using a shotgun when a scalpel will do. He was able to say that in, in, in various ways, get that phrase in, in each of the interviews that he did while we were down there for the, the Muslim ban rally. And, uh, and that was something that made all of the news stories that uh, he was covered in. And next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about Oprah. So uh, I love and follow Oprah all the time. So uh, hopefully that makes you chuckle as it, it does me. But when Oprah was talking about Hillary Clinton in 2016, and this is right before the presidential election, probably about a month or, or, or less out from the 2016 election, and she had a a discussion with uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes and in her interview with him she had three different sound bites and I watched the news at 11 p.m. that night and then again the next morning at the 6 a.m. news to see what the media did with her sound bites and I'm just going to pick on two because they were they were back to back and uh, and when she said them I thought oh those are definitely going to be ones that the media picks picked up on and they were the two that the media most picked up on uh, Mary can click again and pull the other one up on the screen so she said you don't have to like her do you like this country and then she followed up with do you like this country you better get out there and vote. And those two things, when anybody was talking about in the media world, when anybody was talking about Oprah's interview uh, there, those two things, one of those two things came up every single time. So now that you've seen examples of what a soundbite can look like, we want to invite you to take the next couple of minutes about three minutes or so to try to create your own soundbite on your own issue, whatever issue you want to choose. And we're going to take three minutes by my watch. I have 454. So at about 457 or, or thereabouts, we will uh, we'll ask for some volunteers to share if they'd like the three to nine second soundbite that they feel they've come up with for their issue. And Mary, you can advance to the next slide as the title slide.
Okay, we're going to come back and ask if anyone wants to share a sound bite. Again, you can do that either within the chat or raise your hand and Mary can unmute you and uh, you can share your, your sound bite idea with us. Great, yeah, it looks like we have quite a few in the chat if folks Cynthia, I'm going to unmute you to share. Great. Hi, I'm Cynthia Lee, and um, I'm a professor at the George Washington University Law School. I'm working on police reform efforts, and my, slow, my soundbite is, if we want to change police culture, we have to change the law on police use of force. And then I have one more because my friends on the left who support abolition often will say reform is inadequate or reform is insufficient and will not support police reform. I have this petition that I'm trying to get people to sign um, and I'm really frustrated when they won't sign it. But I would say, and this is borrowing from President Obama in his eulogy of John Lewis, it's not an either or abolition or reform, but a both and. You can seek abolition and support reform. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for allowing me to. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Cynthia. And then I see that Claire, if you can unmute yourself. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Claire Woosley, and I'm a recent graduate um, with my master's in public health from the University of Washington. And um, I was uh, working on a state, Washington state bill addressing lead in school drinking water. And actually there was a sound bite from when I did testify in the state. Um, uh, so another one I think would be really good since the law is going to be, um, was not passed this year for next year, uh, kids are supposed to grow at school without laws on lead levels, they are drinking away their health. Can you say that one more time? No problem. Kids are supposed to grow at school. Without laws on lead levels, they are drinking away their health. Nice, okay, I like that. I didn't hear the first part uh, very clearly, so thank you, thank you for repeating that. Wow, this is great. You guys are, are, are really good at this exercise. This is amazing. Uh, Mary, do we have one more? Anyone else who's willing to share? Yes. Margaret, do you want to share out loud? Hi, um, this is Margaret. I really do have particular things in mind, but ex um, except I do feel very strongly about holding this fall. <laughs> so I guess my sound bite is something like, do you like what is happening in this country? Go out to vote this fall to do your part. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, we definitely need some sound bites around voting. We need to get people out there voting. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, uh, if if others have Thank you. if others have sound bites that they would like to share, please put those in the chat. And um, we're going to move on in the interest of time. I want to make sure we have plenty of time because Bernie has some amazing takeaways for you at the end of this presentation. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time for that and also opportunity for question and answer at the end. Uh, so next slide, please. I will breeze through these next couple of slides. It's really a snapshot to get you thinking about the different media that you can consider when, when thinking about who do you want to approach. So next slide, Mary, is fine, national press. National media outlets. And so something that's interesting about, uh, about folks on here is thinking about 
if you have the opportunity to have a story in an associated press, AP or Reuters, you have that story have the potential to exponentially be shared in other outlets. So uh, that's a coveted moment that uh, that communications professionals love is when they can get that associated press story. They know that it's going to be shared uh, widely. But think about in terms of the work that you do, who is it that you can reach out to in terms of outlets on a national scale that might be able to help you tell your story. Next, please. Internet news. Uh, I put this in here as another way for you to think about how your story can be shared it's not just all about television uh, or newspaper. Also think about the outlets that have a really great internet base as well. And, and recognizing that this, a story in any one of these internet and uh, news-based places is also going to get you an opportunity for your article and your issue to be seen on social and uh, and shared widely. So think about in terms of when you want to approach an outlet, if they have multiple ways that they're sharing the story, uh, that really bodes well for you as well in terms of how many people you can exponentially reach. And then lastly, next slide, to touch on a moment of the importance of ethnic media that allows us to reach straight into the community. These are the trusted sources of news. And when you think about it within the community, going to an outlet like World Journal um, or uh, Telemundo for uh, for the Latino community. Those are those are sources that um, that people trust and that they're looking to. So you can provide them with translated articles that are ready to be dropped in, or you have the opportunity to offer in language interviews for them with your spokesperson or someone within the community. Again, thinking about how you fit into the news and into the news cycle. And next slide. So just take a moment as Bernie begins to talk to you about the importance of finding the right person to approach in the newsroom. Please take a moment to drop into the chat some of the other media outlets that you consume or that you try to approach to get your story told. Bernie? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in the next couple of pages, I'm going to talk, give you sort of a really broad overview of how a, this is more of a traditional or a television uh, production newsroom uh, is structured. Um, we basically have um, three different functional areas of, of the newsroom, right? You have the area that produces the show, then you have the area that um, the area of the newsroom, the, the part of the newsroom that actually is in charge of acquiring the content and managing the logistics of our content acquisition, our crews, our camera crews out in the field, um, and then there's a third part, which is on the, the next page, is on the uh, on story construction. So let's start with show production. So this is the part of the room where you have, you know, your anchors, your producers, your associate producers, and your writers working together um, 
to pull in all the pieces uh, that they will need to put into a news show, a newscast. The anchors are, you know, generally the face of the show. Um, and they're very much also involved in the editorial and the writing and the copy editing of the scripts uh, for the show. They're also the ones, as we talked about before, um, who conduct um, the, on, uh, the all, any of the guest interviews or the interviews that happen on set, on the anchor set. Then you have the production team, the producers, the writers, the associate producers. And this is the team that decides the lineup, the show lineup. Um, what is the lead story of the show? Uh, what stories and what order should the stories run in the show? Uh, how much time each story is allotted in, in, a, in a show? Um, they also decide which stories don't make it into the show um, because there's just you know too much news going on that day. Um, they're the ones who, who uh, will write and copy edit the scripts will um you know talk coordinate um the the stories with the reporters out in the field and they're also the ones who will help um book the guests for the interviews do the pre-interviews help and work with the anchors on on those interviews um they're also the team that works on the graphics and all of the other sort of visual elements that go into what you see in that one show so that's the show production uh, side of the room. The next uh, the area of the newsroom is field acquisition. Um, and this includes the assignment editors. The assignment editors are the ones, the assignment desk. They're, they're the ones who uh, will receive the phone calls from the public, will receive phone calls and, uh, you know, press releases and emails and, and um, announcements, advisories from, from government officials, from organizations. Um, they are also the ones that will uh, call and help to, to confirm information that we get. They're the ones that also deals with the, the daily assignments. They kind of traffic cop um, all the stories that were our reporters, our camera people, our journalists are, are chasing that day. Um, they are also in charge of, of, of asset management, basically knowing where all of our resources are at any given time. They know where um, all our camera crews are, where our live trucks are, where our journalists are, and they will be the ones to uh, reallocate those resources if a, a new story breaks um, somewhere. They, since they know where everybody is, they will be the ones to reach out to those resources that's closest to the news, uh, the scene of the, the breaking news, and break them from what they're doing and send them to that breaking news story. Um, uh, and they're also the ones that actually receives, you know, when we when you see a uh, or hear a news room um, pushing out a, a news tip hotline, you know, call this number if you have a news story that you want us to chase. The assignment desk usually is the place that will pick up the phone and answer those calls. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and then the researchers. The researchers are also usually with the assignment editors at the assignment desk, and they are um, the ones who will help um, book guests for, you know, anchor on set interviews or book interviews for the reporters out in the field. They are, like I said, they're the ones that will receive, because they're at the assignment desk, they'll receive a lot of the story tips. They are all also the ones that will track social media. So if there's something going on or if a, a news breaks on social media, which happens more often now uh, than ever, or if something's going viral on social media, they will also be the ones to track that and to let the rest of the newsroom know that something is happening. And like I said, they're, uh, they're the ones who will um, be confirming information um, that we get, whether it is on social media, whether it is a news tip, 
um, whether it's a press release, they're the ones that will, will call out and try to confirm that information. Um, the third part of the newsroom actually is the story creation part. And this is where um, our journalists um, will be pulling together the information and creating those individual stories that will ultimately go into a show. Um, and by and large, um, the people in this part of the newsroom are the, are the reporters, the beat reporters. They're the ones that are coming up with the story ideas. They're the ones that are doing the research on the stories. Um, you know, and the beat reporters, you have different types of reporters depending on the newsroom and the market that you're talking about. But, you know, most newsrooms have um, general assignment reporters who are sort of the breaking news reporters, right? They're the ones that get assigned to go cover sort of the spot news of the day, the breaking news of the day. And then you have beat reporters, and those reporters are the ones who are assigned a particular beat, whether it is, again, politics or sports or health or, or real estate or the economy. And they become the subject matter experts for that newsroom on that beat, and they will find those stories that uh, in their beat, pitch the stories in the beat. Um, they're the ones that will, will be, uh, you know, uh, amassing people and phone numbers and contact information in their list um, to use as sources in the future for uh, of stories. They're the ones that um, are constantly um, out there trying to build their, um, the number of sources they have in their beat. Um, and then they're the ones that, you know, will, will be the, will be pitching their stories that they find to the editors and to the executive producers in the newsroom. And then if we go to the next slide, the, the these reporters will work with managing editors. In some cases, they're managing editors. In some cases, it's it's a, 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 like a metro editor or an assistant news director. But they will be working with a newsroom leader uh, in the creation of that story in the um, in crafting the story coming up with the angle of the story ultimately the the managing editor will make sure that you know we the reporter covers all of his or her bases uh, as it relates to, to all the different voices and angles uh, that that story should have in it and the managing editor will ultimately be the one to copy edit the reporter's scripts before they go into edit and before it gets on television Um, next slide, please. So I didn't know, you know, Michelle, at this point, if we wanted to break for another question or any questions or anything like that before I go into the takeaways. Um, sure, Mary, if there are any additional questions in there or someone wants to raise their hand. We did have a question earlier from Maggie Wong who asks, is it recommended to directly message reporters or journalists that cover a particular topic and what would be the next most efficient way to reach out to them? Yeah, I, I recommend reaching directly out to that beat reporter uh, with the topic or the story pitch or the story idea or the piece of information you may have. You know, the fastest way right now to reach out to them is you know honestly through social media um but you know then you know obviously an email will will work although be aware that reporters get a ton of emails you know press releases all of the stuff uh sitting in their inbox so um but you know an email will work uh, a, a phone call will also work and leaving a message the last place I would go to pitch, to try to reach a reporter, but um, is through the assignment desk. If you have the main, you know, the number to the, the main number to the newsroom, that would be sort of the last place I would go. But, but it does work. If that's the only contact information you have for the reporter, then, you know, go that route. Um, but now, now you're calling another part of the newsroom to get access to that reporter. Um, 
my first point of contact I, I recommend would be on, you know, either Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram. And they all have profiles. Yes. And, and certainly once you have, uh, you have reached that reporter and you think that that's a reporter that you're going to want to cultivate a relationship with, then you ask them how they prefer to be contacted because some reporters will say, uh, only contact me via phone. And some will say, I never respond to anything but uh, a DM through social media. So you just have to also ask that question of the reporters as you're trying to build that rapport to understand how they want to be uh, contacted. Great, thank you. And then Margaret, did you want to ask your question out loud or do you want us to read it? Uh, I can ask out loud. Um, I'm just curious about, so before the final uh, press release, uh, if you're the one who submit the story, do you have a chance to, you know, just do a fact, <laughs> do a final check on the story to make sure what they say is exactly what you, what you meant? Bernie, do you want to take that one coming from the newsroom? <laughs> um, I mean, it, I, I, I guess, so are you asking that once we, the reporter does the interview with you, the, you're asking if the reporter is doing a final check of the facts before they, they publish the story or they print or, or they put the story on television? Is that the, am I understanding that question correctly? Yeah, so um, I mean, <laughs> So I could say something to you, but what you perceive may not be exactly what I mean. <laughs> so what oh. I want to find out is that before the <laughs> so interpretation could be different. Oh, so you're asking, oh. do you get a chance to look at the reporter's story before they actually publish it, or or um, or it shows up on the six o'clock news that night? Yeah, that's yeah. right, because you know, I don't want <laughs> yeah, to be the, misinterpreted. <laughs> yeah, the short answer is no. <laughs> no, the, the reporter, a good reporter will make sure, will ask you, you know, will have a lengthy conversation with you and make sure that he or she completely understands your point of view of the issue. Um, and then the good reporter will then tell you, the most that a reporter will say to you is, this is the angle that I took. And this is when it, you'll see it in the paper or when you'll see it on television. But a reporter will never send you a script in advance of, or, or a news story in advance of it being published or going on television. Now, there, there is an exception or two, um, but they are very rare, where you might have a smaller publication or a smaller newspaper and because uh, because we have had this happen once or twice where uh, someone the reporter reaches back out and says uh, hey here's a copy of my story I just want to make sure that I captured X in in this piece correctly again very rare and if you're dealing with national media you're dealing with mm -hmm. some of those internet outlets that uh, that were on that slide they're not gonna come back to you and give you an opportunity to look at that beforehand. So uh, one thing that I would suggest is if, if you're ever in that situation where uh, something has uh, is erroneous in a story, you can ask mm -hmm. for a correction, but if it's a misinterpretation, um, you know, sometimes you, you, you have to live with the fact that that's not exactly what you said, but also think about the larger context of you did get that media hit and maybe you can take that media hit and do something else with it, maybe a blog that further explains something that you felt didn't get the right contextual um, uh, attention that you wanted in that story. Yeah, and, and news organizations will have very clear standards as to how they approach corrections and mistakes and misquotes in a story. 
Um, if you feel that you were misquoted or took, taken out of context, that's definitely worth a follow up with that particular reporter. Um, and, you know, maybe even a letter to the editor. So what I'm hearing is, is that actually before you even say goodbye to the reporter, maybe it's better way to ask them to summarize to you what, <laughs> what you just said, so that at that, so that you can fact check at that point before they go on to do their work. Yeah. I think there is definitely in the conversation, and it should be a conversation between you and the reporter, you should get a sense of the, the, um, the angle that the story is going to take based on the conversation that you're having with the reporter. Now, there may be times where once the reporter does additional interviews with other people for the story that the angle may change, but at that point, the reporter should call you back and say, okay, you know, well now after further review, further investigation, my, the angle of my story actually has changed a little bit. And so now I have a few follow-up questions for you related to that new angle that I'm, I'm, um, I'm going after now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great. So it looks like we have two more people with their hands raised, um, but being cognizant of time, do you want to take a question or try to follow up? Maybe Bernie, do you want to finish your key takeaways and then we can get to those people with the questions? Sure. Yeah, and the, the key takeaways that I have here are just sort of a summary of, you know, sort of what we've been talking about throughout, which is, you know, when you're on the conversation, when you're on the phone with a reporter or a producer or you know journalist, let's say, make sure you you're ready with the the, the facts. There, you know, every reporter, every journalist is going to want to know the who, what, where, when, why, and how of what you're pitching. Um, you know, and also reiterating what Michelle had said prior was the more information you can give the journalist, the the, the less legwork the journalist will have to do. Clearly, the journalist will have to. Uh, confirm information, but if if you kind of have most of the information there for the for the reporter or the journalist, um, then it'll the the reporter will need less time to turn a story, and at that point, there, it increases the chances of your story actually becoming a story. Um, you know, I'm repeating Michelle here again in in saying that you need to make sure you find a news hook. You know, no, if you know that the the news right now, media is right now focused on the coronavirus and, and the pandemic and the numbers and the hospitalizations and the cases and, and sort of the public health emergency, know that the, you know, the, the news organizations are trying to, to report out every angle there is related to that. And if you can figure out a way to hook what you're trying to pitch to that, um, big news story that's happening, there's a greater chance that your your pitch will actually make it become a story. Um, next page, please. So again, reiterating, you uh, let's you know make sure we understand the news cycle. You you know if there's a a big um, a big news day happening, election day, for example, um, you know some other big news day, we anticipating a big news day, let's try to avoid pitching something that's unrelated to that big news day. Um, Cause then it'll just get caught up in the, in the really busy news cycle and it may not even make it to air or, or make it on uh, into the paper. Um, supplying the human factor, again, reiterating what Michelle said, um, journalists are always trying to put a face to a story. You know, that different, that makes the story more, will resonate more with our viewers and our readers if we can actually um, have a face and have a, you know, quote unquote, um, vic whether it's a victim or somebody impacted by the 
the thing you're pitching, if we can supply that to the journalist, that again, cuts down on the legwork that the, the journalist has to do and increases the chances of the story actually becoming a story and having it be turned around in a timely manner. Um, and sometimes, you know, depending on the state that we're talking about, um, I think in most cases, we have to get releases to uh, interview and children. So if there was a way that we can help the journalists, you know, obtain those releases, um, if it's a story that's related to children, um, if we could supply that and facilitate those releases for the, for the journalists, then that would also um, increase the chances of the story becoming a, a story. Um, next page, please. Oh, there we have it. Any questions? <laughs> All right, everyone. So that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Great questions. And thanks to those of you who were so brave and shared your sound bites with everyone. You all did great. We hope that Michelle and Bernie's tips and experiences will help you in growing and amplifying your own work. And a huge thank you to Michelle and Bernie for joining us today to share their knowledge and how Advancing Justice AAJC and Spectrum Networks plans their media strategy, engages with the media, and creates a mutually beneficial relationship with the media. As a reminder, this webinar is recorded and we will send out the recording and presentation after the webinar. And this is the first of three webinars that we have planned together. So we look forward to being in touch about our next webinar. You will receive the recording and a presentation from us in a few days. So thank you again for being with us and we look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who had your hands raised, if you uh, want to, please feel free to follow up. My email's on the screen. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>